Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Ron Paul Liberty Report. I'm Daniel McAdams of the Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Dr. Paul is away today, so I'll be taking the helm. Today we're going to discuss the Hollywoodization of war, whether Hollywood shapes our perceptions of war and conflict and may in fact uh, help feed the increasing militarism in American society. Uh, we're joined today by Phil Giraldi, who was a longtime CIA intelligence officer uh, with expertise in the Middle East and is now the executive director of the Council of the National Interest. Now, Phil, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Phil, you wrote a, an, a really incredible Memorial Day column for the UNS Review, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you here today. Uh, it's called Nazis on the Back Lot, How Hollywood Has Changed Our Perception of War. And in the column, you started out talking about how we have a, there's a shifting perception of the price that's to be paid uh, for war uh, that's been shaped primarily by Hollywood and video games. Could, could you give us uh, just a quick summary of, of what the article was about and your main points? Well, basically, I talk about how the United States has, uh, uh, by virtue of being sheltered by two oceans, has, has always been protected uh, from some of the worst consequences of war. Uh, Europeans, of course, remember very well the Second World War and the devastation it caused and the millions of people that were killed by it. Uh, the United States never experienced any of that. So our sole perception of, of war is what we see essentially um, on television or in the movies. And Hollywood has created this monster, which is essentially a, a, a video game type of, of war in which uh, Americans are generally uh, virtuous, that uh, uh, essentially they always win in one way or another, and, uh, and that the, uh, the devastating damage that, that many other people in the world are very much aware of is kind of excluded uh, from the depiction. So when Americans say they support boots on the ground or kinetic action in, in various places, uh, they're actually quite ignorant of what all this stuff means. It means getting your, your head blown up blown off and your and your house getting blown up and uh, uh, we don't quite understand that you know, but Hollywood is, has always been sort of uh, hand in glove with 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 the government and the war machine you know going back to Frank Capra who was paid by the US government to get Americans excited about fighting World War II. but do you see the, a, a change in how Hollywood portrays war now do you think it's it's getting worse now and, and how so well, I think it's getting worse because one of the other things I said in my article is that up until 1973 there was a draft, so that many people coming from you know working middle class families in the United States had very direct knowledge of at least some of the horrors of war. Uh, this has kind of vanished. As uh, uh, I'm, I'm no proponent of the draft, uh, absolutely not. But the fact is that the draft did create a certain awareness among a broader population. Of, of some of the very bad things about uh, uh, military service in general and about war in particular. This has vanished. Uh, uh, something less than 2% of Americans have any exposure to the military, and uh, essentially 98% of the population, uh, insofar as they understand war at all, get it through, as I noted, video games and from Hollywood. There seems to be an inverse relationship between the actual experience Americans have with war and their and their willingness or in interest in lionizing war and in celebrating militarizing holidays such as the Memorial Day holiday and such. You know, I noticed before we came on, uh, you talk about video games and the, the Call of Duty franchise, which is, I guess, the largest of these military uh, uh, games that they play on <coughs> on on TV. 175 million copies sold at a cost of 10 billion or 10 billion dollars in revenues. That seems absolutely incredible. And do you think these young people, once they get a taste for for war on their on their computers or TVs, are they running off to to meet with their recruiters, or is this sort of a is this a satisfy their interest in playing these these pretend games? Well, in a way, I guess it's just a venting of aggression. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, you know, uh, strangely enough, of course, the military has has itself adopted uh, certain tropes from the from the uh, from the games. Uh, the, the guys who blow up um, wedding parties in Afghanistan 
uh, sit in an air-conditioned suite in Nevada. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how these things play on each other. Uh, my, my problem with all of this, of course, is, is it trivializes uh, what getting killed or what two nations going at each other in an attempt to destroy each other really means. And, and, and this, of course, uh, does translate into a, a broad public perception that really war is not that bad. Yes. Now, you mentioned about Hollywood, but I, I, looking at the, the comments to your article, comments in, in many ways are, are as interesting as the articles themselves because it really gives you a, a sense of what people are thinking when they read what you've written, and it, you probably feel that way yourself. But some of the comments uh, I found enlightening uh, dealt with, uh, well, what about the news media? Does it not also trivialize war? It doesn't show people being burned alive in eastern Ukraine or or wedding parties being bombed. Do you think they're they're complicit in this uh, sugarcoating of war? Yeah, I think they are, and, and probably one could argue that every war movie ever made by any country is is basically propaganda that tries to show war in a certain way. But I, what is particularly disturbing in the American experience, I think, is that it the war is kind of painless. You know, it's it's like. Uh, in a way, nobody gets hurt. I mean, it's, it's just, it's depicted in a way that doesn't allow the viewer to share the agony of, of people being killed, being burned alive. I mean, when we, when we firebombed uh, Tokyo, we killed, what, 140,000 people. Uh, how must that, ex what is that experience like? Is there ever going to be a Hollywood depiction of it? Uh, when we bombed Dresden, we killed 50,000 people. Hamburg, I think, was 40,000. Uh, and, and so we have this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a war that's not really a war. You can't see the people screaming. You can't see them dying. So when some idiot like Ted Cruz <laughs> talks about boots on the ground and putting soldiers in Syria, he doesn't see all the dead bodies. He doesn't care about the dead bodies. It's not within his, his realm of thought. And, and this is what disturbs me. Too many Americans, uh, uh, when they're asked about their willingness to pursue more military pursuits uh, in, in, um, in the Middle East and in Asia and Africa, uh, really don't have a, have a clear perception of what they're talking about. I notice also the uh, the bravado of the generals on channels like CNN. They come on and they, they bluster about how easy it's going to be. You just got to move a few thousand troops here and there. Uh, you know, the, a lot of them are on the on the uh, payroll of the different think tanks in the Beltway. And I, one of the things you mentioned in your in your article was that no one benefited from the Iraq War and the surge uh, except for the defense contractors. But as you know very very well, Phil, most of these think tanks that come up with these wonderful policy ideas, if you look at their uh, where their co uh, contributions come from, for example, the Institute for the Study of War, uh, the Kagan's out Kimberly Kagan's outfit. It's to the person, uh, or to the corporation, the same people who are making a fortune off of the wars, and they can lavishly pay these generals to pontificate about how easy it's going to be. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Follow the money is always a good rule. And, and these people are funded, essentially. They have very good livings, very good jobs. They appear on television a lot more frequently than you and I do. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, these people uh, benefit greatly from uh, their connection with the war industry. And, and uh, I, I would see this, this as, a, as a serious issue, that we have a, a, a lot of bottom feeders who are actually uh, feeding the system and, and feeding the system to create this tolerance for war. And I would, I would also add your comment about the generals. Uh, you know, we have generals that themselves have never experienced combat. Uh, General Petraeus, who was, uh, who was billed by the Kagans, of course, as the new Napoleon, in effect, uh, he was never in combat in his whole career. It was a, it was a, a four-star general who never experienced combat personally, and, and yet, you know, he's held up as an example of, of how to do it. Uh -huh. I mean, this is quite ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Phil, going back to the comments, I wanted to s switch gears just slightly because something else struck me uh, that I've often thought about, and that is how perplexed, at least in my, in my perception, the rest of the world is about U.S. foreign policy. They don't seem to understand what are the goals, what do they want to do, where do they go next. I remember probably 10 or 12 years ago, uh, a friend of mine was the Belarusian ambassador in Washington, and he had, I think, watched one of Bush's State of the Union speeches. 
And he said, I sat there thinking, just tell us what you want us to do. We'll do it. You know, they couldn't figure out. They're ready to be compliant, but they have no idea what Washington wants. And one of the comments uh, under your article was from a person who identified as a non-American. And he or she said she finds it difficult to understand the mindset of the American people. They maintain a gigantic and enormously costly military. They send their soldiers to die and kill in large amounts on countries on the other side of the world. Yet the public somehow believes it's all necessary, necessary to defend their freedoms. It's very interesting how, how, how confusing it is. Do you think, I mean, in your experience, uh, the rest of the world is as confused as you and I are about this? Well, the rest of the world, again, has, a, has a, a much better perception of what war entails, and that's, that's part of the problem. And, and I think there's a, a huge gap between, uh, literally, the rest of the world and the United States in terms of how they perceive uh, military advantage and how they perceive going to war. And, and this is the really dangerous bit about it, because we actually have a country that's out of sync with the rest of the world in terms of not seeing the military as... Uh, as our Constitution stipulates, as a mechanism to defend the country, we're seeing it as a, a tool for foreign policy. And, and uh, for other countries, uh, uh, this is just incomprehensible. They, why are you doing this? Why are you engaging in this? Why are you rationalizing this to, to, uh, to uh, you know, state the, the belief that this is something that is a reasonable policy? Because it's not. Yes. And I think you answered the question in your piece, which is the reason it's being done in the U.S. is because people are completely unaware of the real costs of war. And you mentioned, I'd like to close with something that you, that you mentioned in the piece that I thought was very powerful. You said, my point is when Americans think of war, they think of something heroic and relatively painless, unless you're somehow electrocuted by your PlayStation. So I think, um, you know, we, 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 we have to fight not only war, but war propaganda, which we see everywhere. And that's that's what we try to do here on the Ron Paul Liberty Port Report. Uh, Phil, I want to thank you very much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to talk to you and, and gain some of your expertise. I want to thank all of our viewers out there for tuning in to the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Please share our videos if you like them with your friends and your family and your, even your enemies. Continue to watch us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Once again, thank you very much for tuning in.